Hello. Mic check, mic check. Is the mic working? You guys hear me? OK, good, thanks. Yeah, so my talk's about um, basically uh, bringing, making eBPF easier to use. And sometimes you do that using a framework uh, and other tools. So we're going to look at that. My name is Chris. Uh, I am a principal technical PM at Microsoft. I'm also uh, one of the photographers for this uh, event. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also a founder uh, of this conference. And so I've been to all of them. And uh, this is definitely a very interesting venue for this. So awesome. Uh, great location, though, right? <laughs> OK. So this presentation is basically going to be uh, divided up into four parts. Uh, we're going to look at um, some definitions. Uh, so what are we actually talking about? Uh, we want to. I want to give a short intro to an overview to eBPF. Um, and of course, we had a, a very detailed uh, presentation earlier today. So I'm going to kind of build on top of that. Um, and I want to talk about why an eBPF data collection framework is needed. Um, and um, then I want to show Inspector Gadget and the context of a framework. Um, by the way. Yeah, the, the whole, the, I kind of threw that in there here. Uh, but you know, we're building a, a f this, this framework, and it's called Inspector Gadget. But I'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, definitions. Uh, I want to talk about what is EPF, what is data collection, what I mean by data collection, and what is a framework. Um, and so on the eBPF I.O. website, uh, we have this definition, uh, which is, you know, uses a superlatives like, you know, uh, revolutionary uh, technology. And then it kind of goes into with the origins in the Linux kernel. In this context of this talk, we're only going to be talking about the Linux kernel. It's become so popular uh, that, you know, other operating systems, including Windows, is implementing something very similar. Uh, and also, you can run. Um, uh, you know, there are also things called uprobes, which allow you to run eBPF on use, in user space. Um, and so, but we're going to be talking about the Linux kernel stuff here. Uh, and it's, it, and so the next part of that is it, to, they can run sandbox programs in a privileged context, uh, such as in the Linux kernel. And it's used uh, to safely, efficiently extend the capabilities of the kernel without requiring uh, to change the kernel source code or load kernel modules. Now, this is, the revolutionary part. So because now we can dynamically add features or functionality to the Linux kernel. So one can say that, oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, so basically, the Linux kernel is now a runtime uh, for eBPF programs. And I don't think that's really an exaggeration. Um, you can do so much with it. And that's why it's being used all over the place and people are talking about it. And so, but what is meant by safety? Um, so eBPF programs cannot harm the kernel. Um, so they cannot crash the kernel. They always run to completions, are limited in size, and they must be of finite complexity, and they cannot directly access memory. You need a helper function for something like this. And so how do we know this? Uh, as the talk earlier talked, uh, um, discussed, uh, it uses what's called a verifier. And also as that talk uh, discussed, uh, I'm not going to go into that because it's very complex. Let's just trust it. <laughs> um, and it also requires privileges. So you can't just load these uh, being a normal user. You need to have uh, privileges. So note, uh, this does not mean that eBPF programs cannot do harm to your system. For example, if you load a BPF program in there that randomly routes your packages or drops them, uh, you're probably going to run into issues. And so it does not crash the kernel, uh, but you should just like with any process that you load onto your computer or your server or whatever, uh, you should know what it's doing uh, and not just run random things there. I went the wrong way again. So why is eBPF efficient? Uh, eBPF programs run in the kernel space. They're just in time compiled to native machine code. That means they're just as fast as the code in, in the kernel itself. Uh, they're event driven, so they don't run all the time. They just run when things happen. Uh, and it avoids expensive context switches between kernel space and user space. Now, this is very important for the data collection part, because often you would have to send all this information up to the user space and then do the filtering there. And so that's a lot of context switches that you have. Uh, with eBPF, we can actually do the filtering inside the kernel. And this limits the amount of stuff we have to spend, send up to the um, user space, uh, making it way more efficient. So. So there's some popular eBPF uh, projects that you probably know. For example, Cilium, Falco, and Pixie. Uh, these are used for different uh, uh, 
cases. Sometimes they overlap. Uh, but basically, you can use them in a, uh, eBPF in a lot of different ways. Uh, what we're going to focus on this time, uh, this, this, uh, um, this, well, actually, what I want to say is Inspector Gadget itself doesn't really care what you do with the data. It collects data. If you want to build a security tool on top of it, you can. If you want to build an observability tool on top of it, you can. Or a detection tool, alerting tool, you know, it's up to you. And this is, uh, so. Now, what is meant by data collection? Now, I'm exactly talking about the extraction and augmentation of systems data. So when I talk about extraction, that means pulling it out of the system. Augmentation means there's um, some kind of, you need to add something to it. It's not data analysis, it's just adding something to the data as it comes out. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. So we are not talking about storage or analysis of data. And uh, so what does it mean when I say a framework? And actually, I wanted to ask you folks that. What, and you can just shout it out, uh, what is a characteristic of a framework? What, what should a framework do for you? OK. Plugins, accessibility, maybe? OK. I'm sorry? OK, one at a time. <laughs> OK, I assume that means removing boilerplate instead of adding boilerplate? <laughs> OK, uh, more? An abstraction, yes, yes. OK, anything else? Huh? <laughs> framework laptop. He has a framework laptop. Thanks you for the advertisement, sir. <laughs> OK, anything else? All right, so all those things are kind of saying uh, it should make things easier, right? Um, so let's take a look at how BPF is right now. So we had a discussion uh, talk very, it was, I think the first one, um, that went really deep into things. And it kind of left for the audience uh, to look into the libraries that load these. So actually, that's what we're going to look at right now. And so first of all, this is a BPF program. It's a very short one. It's not as short as the one uh, that was shown earlier today. But basically, what this does is it, um, it's telling us which um, pr processes are, are being exact on our system. So. But I think it's better to look at this inside of a, yeah, inside of here. Let me get to my demo. OK. So here, is that, I need to make it bigger? Yes, bigger. OK. Let's see how this works. OK, that's going to be, yeah, OK. So here we have uh, a few fi uh, files. The only ones that are really uh, part of the logic here are the kprobe file. Here, this is going to be our BPF program and the main uh, Go file. Now, what I'm going to be using for this is the um, eBPF Go library uh, that's developed from the, by the Cilium folks uh, or isovalence folks. Um, and so they, and I'm using their, um, their let's, let's look at this real quick. Oops, sorry, it's doing some updates. OK, so here we have a BPF program. It's defining a map. Um, and this, the talk earlier talked about this SEC, where it, it basically puts it in a section of the ELF file. Um, and this is the section. And so it's basically uh, just looking for um, a process that's being exact and uh, putting it in the, in the map. OK, very simple. So if I go oops, here. This is the Go code. I'm not sure why this is not here. Let me do this. There we go. That's easier. And so if we go here, we'll see that we have um, some libraries. Now, interesting enough, um, so the, this library actually uses Go Generate to actually convert uh, this um, to basically uh, you know, make this uh, suitable for, the for this uh, Go code. And so that's why we'll use Go Generate in a little bit. But basically, what I want to show is basically I don't need to go into this code at all. Uh, but basically, you have to do this for every BPF thing you, you uh, BPF program you, you have. It's a lot of like boilerplate is what we're saying. Um, and so then here at the bottom, what we do is we attach it to um, uh, the K-probe uh, for that. And then we um, are basically uh, saying we're going to return the result. Um, I think it's every second here, um, basically in a, using a ticker every second. Um, 
uh, it's going to basically read this map where that information is being put into uh, from the BPF uh, file. Um, and so you can see it in user space. So let us um, close that. And if you look here at the make file, oops, sorry. You can see I'm going to be running uh, this build here, uh, go generate. And OK. And so let's do make build. And so this basically has given me a Go program that I can then run. And so as we saw in that make file, we have, um, let's just run that again. So if you see here, we're going to do uh, sudo because we need permissions to run this. And so let's do make run. I have to put in my, oops, I put in my wrong password. This is a VM I'm running on because obviously it has to run on Linux. Um, and so if I go into here and I go, you know, word count, um, make file, and go back over here and I see uh, that there has been some things executed. So we can see that. And so this helped us get this information from the kernel. You can kind of see this uh, basic process. So let me get out of here. OK. And let me go back to the presentation. So what have we done here? Uh, what have these eBPF and this helper libraries given us? They've given us a very powerful, powerful and performant mechanism for getting systems information from the kernel. Uh, it's a means to programmatically load eBPF uh, programs and an interface for retrieving the data from the maps uh, in user space. But there are many things that you likely want to do with this data. Um, first of all, and very importantly, which um, is, is a whole thing into itself, is you want to relate that data to your system. So when you get information from the kernel, it has no idea about Kubernetes uh, pods or even containers, because that's not really a concept in the, in the Linux kernel. They'll give you things like uh, mount ID and things like that, and then you have to relate that yourself. And we call this enrichment, um, and we'll get to that in a second. You'll likely need to augment this data in user space, and this might be because when you take the data out of the user space, you want to add something to it before you send it on to your to your services or logs or whatever, and um, and so and so it could be that you want to send something from like a, a service that you have or whatever, but it could be that you kind of it's necessary because BPF programs like we talked about earlier are kind of limited in what they can do and doing like string manipulation or something like that. Uh, you don't, you, sometimes you can't, and sometimes you just don't want to do it inside the kernel. And so you might want to do that um, when you get into user space. And so, for example, we have a DNS um, gadget, which, we'll talk, which um, you can see in, the, in this repo. That in the, it's one of the tools we have. You can go check it out. Um, that, uh, because the DNS requires some string parsing, we actually need to do that in user space. And so that's what I mean by augmenting the data. Uh, and we might need to send this to a service. We want to send this to our logs. We want to send it to our um, time series database, or we want to send it to um, you know, wherever, or a trace server. Um, and you want to share. Uh, you might want to share these, right? You want to want an easy way to give what you created to somebody else. Or in the next point, you, know, you, you probably don't want to become a Linux kernel. Uh, not everybody needs to be. And so if we can create a mechanism like a, a framework, for example, uh, where you can basically just uh, find some off-the-shelf programs, have a, have a framework where you can like, easily run those and, and, and do all the stuff that you need to do outside of the BPF world itself, um, that would be very nice. So, so this is, OK, make sure I don't have anything else there. So this is when I want to introduce Inspector Gadget as an eBPF uh, data collection framework. Now I say uh, introducing as a framework because you can actually use it uh, directly using these gadgets. Um, and you can you know, use it as a tool to inspect your system. Um, so we're going to look at it as a framework. And so what is the Inspector Gadget? It's an eBPF tool and systems inspection framework for Kubernetes containers and Linux host. Um, when we originally created uh, Inspector Gadget, it was only for Kubernetes because there was really a gap. Like there was this really cool project called BCC, which allows had a bunch of, of, of a bunch of uh, you know BPF tools that you could run. But how do you do that inside of on a, on a cluster on all your nodes? And so we created Inspector Gadget for that. And and these um, these BPF programs were kind of built in. And right now we're we're moving to the to making these uh, image based. Uh, so basically OCI images. We'll talk about in a second. So let's look at the context 
conce uh, concepts. There's some things that are in development, and I put an asterisk on those. So gadgets, uh, gadgets are encapsulate, they encapsulate eBPF programs in OCI images uh, so that we can reuse common container workflows and uh, tooling. So basically, if you know how containers work, you can kind of know how uh, this, this works, because they're the same images. Uh, and they include eBPF programs, um, metadata, which we're, we, we still ha we have one, but we're still defining it because we're trying to figure out all the capabilities that we can define there. Um, and then an optional WASM module. Um, why WASM? Because we need the user space um, processing, and we'll get to that in just a second. So we talked a little bit about, about enrichment. And so this is the process of mapping low-level stuff from the kernel to higher-level things. Right now, we support Kubernetes. We support the various container runtimes. Uh, we even have a PR open for uh, um, System D, so you can see which like, unit or service it's associated to. Um, and it's interesting that this is not only Kubernetes anymore. I want to emphasize, because this has been over the last year and a half or so, we've uh, made this uh, generally available. Because we got the question of what happens when your, when your uh, Kubernetes goes down. Uh, and you basically want to sometimes get under that, and so you can see what's happening there. Uh, but this also works in the reverse, right? We're not only enriching data that comes out, we also want to filter data on, that high, on those high-level uh, concepts. We want to say, uh, only show me the things from this container. Uh, and so we need to translate that uh, into um, the BPF kernel world. So user space processing. Um, so we chose WebAssembly for this, um, and so Currently, uh, you know, WebAssembly is great because you can write it in all, any language that WebAssembly supports, and it provides a sandboxed environment, um, you know, kind of similar to BPF, um, where we can basically embed this in our, in our workflow, and uh, you can include that in your gadget and um, just make it a part of the data um, processing pipeline. So data export, and this is something, this is like our next big challenge, is to make this work really nicely. Um, you can configure gadgets. The idea is to configure, configure gadgets to send the data uh, in various formats to various services. So it might be a time series database, it might be logs, it might be traces, it just might be uh, the CLI. Um, but you, you should be able to decide. And, and so when we talk about this metadata that, that I said was in the process, this is one of the things we're working on is, is basically um, having a, the ability for gadgets to define their capabilities and so you know um, what kind of data is coming out. Um, and where you can send it. So I'm going to show a demo of building and running a gadget. Let me get over here. So this is actually, um, if we do this, I'm inside of the inspector gadget um, uh, source code. Uh, this is in the subdirectory gadgets. And then we are specifically in the trace open uh, gadget. And you can see here, uh, if we do this again, that we have a gadget YAML. This is the metadata. And we have a program.bpf.c. Uh, this is uh, the BPF program. Uh, this is by convention. We name them this. And if you name them this, you don't have to add an extra uh, build.yaml file, which I think it's called, uh, where you specify it. But you can actually override. You know, For example, if you, got, if you got this and you wanted to add something, you could add that and then add a a build.yaml file and then point to uh, you know, your source code and then rebuild it. Um, so let's, so we're gonna show um, basically the process for building this. And so, so I don't have to type so much. I have made these um, make files. <laughs> and so first we're gonna start with uh, build. And so yeah, we're gonna basically say image, IG, image build. And so IG is the, is the Linux command line tool. We also have a command line tool for a kubectl gadget, that does not have the build functionality, that should be local, it shouldn't be uh, in the cluster. And so um, this is why I'm using this, and I'll also use it for the demo. You can assume when I'm actually running these things uh, that you can do that just as well in, in a Kubernetes cluster. So, uh, right, let's run this. So make build. So, and I have my... You can see we have this behind the experimental flag uh, because currently we have um, the default is the built-in ones. Uh, that'll be converting in the next months, actually, pretty soon. Um, so we successfully built this, and if we do our make list, we see that we have this in there. Um, it's called Chris Trace Open, um, and just so we, I don't remember, 
expect you folks to remember everything here, because I don't. Um, and so we have, then we, we're going to do the run, okay? And when we run it, you can see we've done IG run. We reference uh, this. And because it's local, I don't have to do the whole repository. Uh, 10 minutes. OK, good, thanks. Um, and then I specify that I want to filter on the test trace open container. So I'm going to say I want only information from this container. Uh, so let's do make run. Good. It's waiting. There's not anything that's happened in that container. You know why? Because that container has not yet existed. And so if I do make test, um, actually, I, yeah, I think, da, 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 da. yeah, I don't think I can. Let me run this directly. And if you see something that's obviously wrong, let me know. Man, why am I not able to delete? What's that? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, shoot. That's, that's right. Um, so let's go in here. Yeah, I think I, when I tested this, I, yeah, OK. So let's go in here and just remove that, because I, I just want to get a terminal, right? Damn it all. OK. OK, so let's do this. So this is working now. And if we go, I just want to go back over here. Um, nothing's really happened. And if we open a file, let's see what we got here. What do, what do we want to open? Oh, I know what we can open. We can do Word. We can do less. And then we can do etc, host name, right? Boom. Oh, I didn't need to do that. I could have done cat, right? But that should serve our purpose. And you can see right here now, um, it shows us that we opened the host name. This might be interesting, if, for example, if you want to see if somebody's trying to open a, um, a you know, password file or whatever. Uh, but that's just a demo of how this basically works, right? Uh, it shows the filtering. Uh, actually, we'll I have a whole slide about what that showed. So let's do that. Um, all right. So let's review what we did, exactly. Uh, so we compiled the EBPF program. Uh, we built an OCI image uh, that includes our program uh, and the metadata. Uh, we enriched the EPPF data with high-level resource info, but we also did it the other way. We filtered based on that. Uh, we ran an EPPF code, filtered the data based on these high-level resources, and uh, we returned the data to the command line. Now, like I said, we were working on the export stuff, and that should be able to send it anywhere. And by the way, you can already send it uh, pretty much anywhere, because you can get it as JSON and do what you want to with it. Um, and so how can I use this? Well, you can use this directly with the IG or kubectl gadget tools. You can use it via a library. So you can actually consume this uh, inside your application as a library and just use these gadgets. Um, it's available, and I'm not actually sh sure what the status of this. I think they asked the team. Uh, Kubernetes CRDs and, and config maps, that's how you can deploy them and you can interact with them. And uh, we're working on an API for this. Um, and we actually basically have a plugin we're working on for, headlamp, for the headlamp in the headlamp project uh, that will ba basically be utilizing this. So uh, some Inspector Gadget users, um, the, there was a uh, presentation earlier from the Armo folks. They're actually using Inspector Gadget underneath for their, um, uh, for their BPF needs. Uh, it's in Microsoft Defender for Cloud. So it's running on lots of machines inside of Azure. And actually, because they, they actually support other clouds and other clouds, I presume, and other uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, and there are others, and we, and we actually need to start collecting uh, users. So if you, if you are a user or you know some, uh, please let us know. Um, yeah, so to learn more, uh, you can contact, you can go here. I think I have a typo in here, but you can figure it out. Yeah, I got five minutes. Uh, and Slack is probably the best place to communicate with us. Um, and we'll have a booth at the pavilion, the project pavilion, on Wednesday and Thursdays. Uh, I think Wednesday, full day, Thursday afternoon. Um, and then I will be presenting uh, with the Microsoft Defender folks on um, and giving a small part of the Inspector Gadget uh, part of that. Um, that's the end. And questions, comments? Any questions? There's a microphone right here if you want to take it. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. Um, when you ran uh, your command line to build, it needed root. Why did it need root to build the image? What did I do? 
um, in your like build command. Ah, uh, so it's basically putting it in, in var. Uh, I, I probably don't need that, and or we probably change it. Like I said, this is very early. Uh, but when I was doing my demo, I needed it, so I just added it. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's. I think that's that that, that that's uh, completely okay to do sometimes. But yes, thanks for bringing that. Thank you. Okay, without any further questions, I say thanks, Chris. And okay. uh, next talk will be Marcus Noble in 4.35. See ya. <laughs>